It's a pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker, Dr. Atif Zahir. He's a professor of radiology and radiological science at John Hopkins University School of Medicine, as well as the, doc the director of the Cross-Sectional Body Imaging Fellowship Program. Dr. Zahir earned his medical degree from the Aga Khan University. He completed a residency in diagnostic radiology at BIDMC, Harvard Medical School, followed by a fellowship in abdominal imaging and interventional radiology at Brigham and Women Hospital, Harvard Medical School. Dr. Zahir is also the medical director of the e-radiology learning program at Johns Hopkins. He is clinically active in abdominal imaging and also is involved in multidisciplinary conferences for pancreas, liver, and rectal cancer. His research interests include imaging of tumors and inflammatory disorders of the pancreas and is considered a leader in pancreatic imaging. He is the Associate Director of the journal Abdominal Radiology and actively participates in clinical trials. He publishes scientific articles, authors books on pancreatic and gastrointestinal imaging, and gives talks at national and international conferences. We're very happy to have Dr. Atif with us today, and he's going to talk about the academic Qibla. Welcome, Atif. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, for this invitation, I would like to thank Dr. Ula Shaheen, uh, who is an excellent radiologist, a very kind person, and fortunately also a dear friend. In the next few minutes or so, I'll be talking about the academic Qibla or direction and how to stay focused on your ultimate goal. I have no relevant disclosures for this talk, uh, just my deepest regrets for not being able to make it to uh, this uh, conference in person due to some prior commitments. However, um, I do promise to visit soon to make up for this, uh, uh, for this absence. I want to start by asking who amongst us has felt this way in our everyday life, especially at work. I know I have. These are the different directions we are pulled into every day at work. And then there's a small inconspicuous sign on a table in every hotel in the Middle East that reminds us to follow a particular direction. This is exactly what I'm going to talk about today. This is not the formula, but certainly a formula that has worked for me. Every medical institute has this tripartite mission that we're all familiar with, which includes three components. The clinical component, which includes delivering high quality, innovative care with excellent outcomes. The research component, which includes discovering the latest breakthroughs in medical sciences and the educational component, which includes training the next generation of world-class clinicians and academicians. These three circles can be quite daunting if you look at them this way. However, what makes the three circles a little less intimidating is to look at them as interconnected cogwheels. The three components act like cogwheels that are strongly interconnected, and if we develop a stronger relationship between the three, there will be education coming out of patient care and research out of education and patient care out of education and research. However, just like everything else, unfortunately, sooner or later, these cogwheels develop some rust when they're overused and being pulled in all directions. And we need to grease the cogwheels to have them all move in harmony and in the right direction. My ultimate grease for this issue is two things, efficiency and humor. A radiologist looks at thousands of images in a day and this can cause real fatigue to the brain. On top of that, answering phone calls, making medical decisions on people's lives can all be very tough on the brain. What we need to do is to make sure that we have adequate mental energy to stay sharp and avoid any medical errors that may happen due to mental fatigue. Ultradian means many times a day. It refers to the regular oscillating wave pattern that these cycles follow. The primary purpose of ultradian rhythms is to manage the cycles of energy production, output, and recovery that occurs in all humans. This is how the ultradian rhythm works. At the beginning of the day, Within about an hour and a half, you reach the peak of your productivity, entering what's known as the ultradian performance peak. After this, your productivity and performance starts to decline as your body enters what's known as the ultradian trough, or an energetic low point. You start feeling fatigued, then your attention might wander. You might feel the urge to hit the bathroom, or you might experience a craving for coffee, a snack, or to smoke a cigarette if you, if you do that. 
So an understanding of this concept can help you pace yourself during the day with deep work and rest blocks. So what are these deep blocks? I'm going to quote from this book by Cal Newport called Deep Work. They indicate a craftsman's mindset. You have to make time blocks without distractions. Remember, answering emails means addressing other people's priorities, not yours. The time blocks have to be divided into work blocks and love blocks. Deep work is becoming rare and is a very valuable quality. Rest assured, time blocks are the number one tool for time management. When you're doing deep work, you have to have no distractions. You have to have your Wi-Fi off, no emails, no distractions whatsoever. Remember, multitasking is a myth. There's an old Russian proverb that says, chase two rabbits and catch none. Chase two rabbits and catch none. Also know the idea of attention residue. Going from one thing to another leaves some attention residue and the performance of the original task is diminished. Different people have different ways of doing deep work and one has to find out from within themselves what works for them. Some of the deep work philosophies include monk mode where you just become a hermit and just focus on one thing uh, in a place where you have absolute no distractions. Some people have this bimodal way of working where they're fully engaged and then fully disengaged. There's also this rhythmic pattern where deep work is done at certain times. Muhammad Ali, for example, used to wake up early in the morning and at 5.30 a.m. he would run for six miles in heavy boots every day. Some people have this journalistic way of doing work. When they have a deadline, they're on, they, um, they work, they are on call, and then this deep work is performed on demand. Now we have to keep in mind that this deep work has to be paired with deep love blocks as well. Make your friends and family a priority. Just like deep work, there shouldn't be work distractions while you're spending time with the loved ones. Finally, to have peak performance, this breathing pattern is suggested, inhale to four and then exhale to six to boost willpower. This takes you out from the flight and fight response to pause and plan response. Say to yourself, I'm excited and I'm going to do really well to fuel this positive energy. This calms a person down and switches one from anxiety to excitement. Now let's discuss the second thing that acts as a brain fuel booster, humor to be able to laugh at our own selves and the situations around us ultimately help us get out of tough situations unscathed. Here I want to emphasize on the point that I'm not encouraging all of us to become clowns, but to have a sense of humor about some of the life miseries can work wonders. Here are the three cardinal principles of how humor can be used as an aid. The first principle is all about appropriateness. This is the common problem we face in our lives every day as a radiologist. Our self-image doesn't quite match the reality, and that is what gets us in trouble. So all these years while other radiologists were reading cases and saving lives, I developed the ultimate scientific solution to the problem. Something I like to call the laugh graph, and here's how it works. On the y-axis is the laughability of the joke, and the x-axis represents the inappropriateness. A linear relationship creates a line that I like to call the funny line. Simple enough so far? Well, there's a little bit more to it. Here comes the political correctness bar. Anything to the left is a go and to the right is a no-go zone. However, there's bad news. This data is really from the 70s. Unfortunately, the, the political correctness line has now moved to the left, way to the left. So what are the no-go zones? Are the yo mama jokes, the fat jokes, the race and religion jokes, the politics and gender jokes, and all the dirty ones. And what you are left with now are the wit and wisdom, situational humor, and puns. However, this is where I like to apply the wit and wisdom factor, which can take the laughability of the joke up, way up. Another thing I'd like to introduce are the immunity loopholes. In general, if you have lived something, you can make fun of it. However, one important caveat is that someone else might be more of who you are and take offense. So you really have to know your audience well. 
because a seemingly funny situation can escalate into something ugly and you can land in a very uncomfortable situation. Sometimes we tell ourselves, well, I've gotten away with this before, so it should be okay. Well, all this time, someone may have been collecting evidence against you and all you had to do was to piss that person off once or twice and they will come after you. The second principle is integration. If it is funny but not relevant, leave it out. This joke about Neil Armstrong going to the moon and taking five photos and the girl going to the bathroom and taking 37 photos is funny but has to be put in the right context. Let's say with excessive imaging of necrotizing pancreatitis, multiple photos, multiple scans conveys the message. Similarly, making fun of these rather unusual professions of a kidnapping expert, paper folder and space lawyer can be your saving grace when asked by a patient during a barium enema if this is what you do for a living. And lastly, the third principle, the delivery of the joke is really important. The three principles of delivery are use an expressive voice, live into the story here and now. Do not tell or show complicated stories where people would lose interest in a few minutes. And finally, as comedians like to call it, find the beat. Slow down, pause, and emphasize at the right moments. Watching stand-up comedians do that can be very helpful. Now that we've talked about how to keep going with the work efficiency and humor, I want to discuss the principle of looking at the big picture. I am more of a big picture guy and I think if we stick to the greater purpose then a few small things here and there like an extra call, few extra studies and unwanted research projects don't mean much as long as we are steadily moving in the right direction to a greater goal. This can be further emphasized by a quote from Hashim Khan. Who's familiar with this sport? It's called squash, a beautiful venue here in front of the pyramids of Giza. One of the best squash players Hashim Khan has this famous quote for that says, and I quote, keep eye on ball. His English was not perfect, but his goals and planning certainly were. Just like everything else in life, a little planning doesn't hurt. And here I'm going to discuss a little advice that I got in life, which I took very seriously. When I first started working as an attending, my division chief, Dr. Fishman, gave me this golden piece of advice. He told me to be an expert in something, even if it is the big toe. Now let's put this quote in the entire perspective of academic advancement. There are four major currencies that are required to excel in academia. These include scientific papers, review articles, books, and book chapters. These help develop one's age index and expertise, which ultimately gives one the status of being a national expert and achieve international recognition. Although the process seems rather daunting, I think we can simplify it. I'm going to walk backwards so that we have our ultimate goal, that is our Qibla, in sight, and we will trace our steps backwards to know what we need to do today to get there. Now, to be a national expert and have international recognition, one needs to present at national meetings and be part of their committees. Once one is there, you have to basically say yes to every opportunity that comes your way and sooner or later, you will be a known person at the national level. Now you may ask the question that yes, it's all fine and dandy, but how do I get to present at national meetings and be invited to the committees? To answer that question, I'll recite this share or couplet for you in Farsi, which translates as, if you desire to be a prolific writer, then keep writing, keep writing, keep writing. And this is where our next step, or rather one previous step comes in. Write, write, and write. To get your name in PubMed, you have to be writing papers all the time. This includes review articles, scientific papers, opinions, letter to editors, or anything else that can be published in PubMed. The ultimate goal is to have a good number of citations and a nice age index. I want to share a picture of the whiteboard in my office where I make columns for all research projects that I'm working on. There are different stages from IRB to data collection, manuscript writing to submission and acceptance. Each box is checked when the task is completed. Sometimes my kids come in and draw 
uh, there as well to keep things more dynamic. To write scientific papers, one needs to access clinical data, which can be a little challenging as a radiologist. So how do we do it? Well, we make friends, good friends. Keep in mind that radiology is only a piece of the larger puzzle that medicine is. And we make friends at the multidisciplinary conferences. This, in my opinion, is the best opportunity for a radiologist and for that matter, any physician to branch out of their comfort zone and learn everything there is to know about a disease and its treatment. This is a photograph of our rectal cancer multidisciplinary conference. Here we have a rectal surgeon, nurse practitioner, a couple of radiation oncologists and oncologists, and of course, the most important person, myself. You can even see a medical student in the background. The point is that everyone is there. Once we develop a thorough understanding of the disease process and treatment options, and the role a radiologist plays in this process is when we develop true clinical excellence. One important point I want to emphasize here is to maximize one's productivity. This cheap plastic instrument serves an important purpose. This with its multiple variations is something that can be used to squeeze as much toothpaste out of a tube as possible. You can find it at a dollar store here in the United States. Same principle can be applied in academics and that is something we call the academic twofer, threefers and fourfers. Once you have a topic identified, one can start with a review article, a scientific paper, an abstract at a meeting, keynote speech, and the list goes on. Here's an example. What starts off as an interesting case of two simultaneous solid pseudopeppery neoplasms of the pancreas can go as a case report to a review article, to a collection of these as a book, and then a keynote speech at a national meeting. Now, once we've gone through this entire circle, we come back to the very first thing we started with be an expert in something even if it is the big toe. So let's go to the, in the right order. Start with the intention of becoming an expert in something. Follow this by gaining clinical excellence, which can be greatly enhanced by being part of a multi-D conference where you can make friends who give you the clinical data, which helps you to write, which in turn takes you to national meeting, which ultimately leads you to become a national expert and acquire international recognition. I want to finish off with these great words of Dr. William Osler, one of the founding professors of Johns Hopkins Hospital. The very first step towards success in any occupation is to become interested in it. Finally, keep in mind, academic medicine is not a sprint, but a marathon. So treat it like one. Thank you very much for your attention.